You're tuned in to the Investing for Beginners podcast. Finally, step-by-step premium investment guidance for beginners. Led by Andrew Sather and Dave Ahern to decode industry jargon, silence crippling confusion, and help you overcome emotions by looking at the numbers. Your path to financial freedom starts now. All right, folks. Well, welcome to Investing for Beginners podcast. I'm Dave Ahern. We have Andrew Sather tonight. Tonight, we're going to talk about investing with your brain. We're going to talk a little bit about how your thoughts can affect the decisions that you make when you invest. Charlie Munger is one of my big heroes, and he has written many, many great articles, speeches, a few books about biases. And tonight we're going to talk about some of the more common biases. And Andrew is going to go ahead and start us off by talking about the recency bias or bias, excuse me. Yeah. So obviously we're all human beings. And something I love to constantly preach is how the stock market's very emotional. We got fear, we got greed. And it's because it's made up of all these people. And there are some common psychological aspects that we as human beings all share that as investors, it can really affect the way we behave. And many of times we're not really aware that this, these are things that are influencing our decisions. So if we can kind of cut that off at the beginning before it can really negatively affect us, it can help our performance. So recency bias, this is the idea that Something that just happened is more likely to happen. So an obvious one uh, example of this is when you see trend followers and, you know, they see, uh, let's say, a, a one month chart and it just has the price going straight up. So the recency bias would say that, you know, as an investor, you expect that stock to continue that trend or you may have a stock that's been flat for like two years because you see that this price is moving and really the price has nothing to do with the value of the business, what's actually going on in the business. We're not digging into the financials and looking at how are the assets changing? How are the earnings changing? Strictly looking at the charts. And I I remember particularly when I first started out, I would often let the last two years or last five years or even six months of stock price data kind of influence how I perceived the future of the stock to to be likely to happen. And it's completely just a ridiculous thought. There there's it there's like a it's like a coin flip where, you know, if you start to see heads consecutively, we have this idea where there's things like momentum and and things like you know superstitions that that certain streaks can continue some in some areas like sports you know this can can really happen when you have human beings and and their you know their confidence and and things like that really affect how their performance is going to go on but when you have companies and and things that are very think you know things that are very mathematical in the sense that if a company gets great earnings, it's it's gonna, it's you know, if a company sells X number of products, it's gonna have this amount of earnings. And as the stock prices kind of fluctuate through the years, the chances of a stock going up or down can be really close to fifty percent. If you look over a very very long period of time, I've actually, being the numbers nerd I am, looked at the S and P five hundred and and. T- took all the daily changes in price and put them out on a big spreadsheet and kind of looked and the, the percentages are very close to 50, 50, uh, slightly tilts towards the market going up. And while it does fall further when it does fall, uh, uh, more of the days go up than down. But so you have really like a, a, a problem, a, 
probability, kind of like a game of chance, kind of like a coin flip on where, whether a stock can will go up or down in the following day. It's it's not something that th- they've done studies on this too. Uh, don't quote me particularly on the exact study, but they have a study that says basically whatever a stock did the day before has no correlation whatsoever with how the stock will perform in the next day, the next week, things of that nature. So that's really a big aspect of recency bias. And it's something that can kind of cloud the way that we look at stocks, the market in general. And if we start to make decisions, particularly on price, and we, you know, we talk about that all the time where you want to focus on value and not so much on on just the price aspect of a stock. You want to look for companies that are growing and not just stock prices that are growing. So I guess another way to look at recency bias, I mean, basically that's that's a big one when it comes to recency bias. And I think it's something that we should all be aware of and try to avoid it when we're trying to purchase stocks. Uh, I like what you were saying about the recency bias. You know, something that uh, I was reading recently, speaking of recency bias recently, haha, that, uh, you know, the hot hand theory that uh, you hear about in basketball, you know, the statistical likelihood of a player making another shot after he has the quote unquote hot hand, you know, he comes down and he makes two or three shots in a row and all of a sudden he's got the hot hand and you start feeding him. They've done statistical analysis. And again, you can't quote me on the exact study because I don't, I don't remember the exact details about it. But the, what I do remember about the study was, is that the, there is no statistical proof that shows that they quote unquote have a hot hand It's you know, it, it comes down to, you know, just the <clears throat> statistical, you know, anomalies of, you know, the guy happened to make a couple shots in a row. So, you know, the, but the, you would bet that he would make another shot because he made the previous two and it really has no correlation to, to the previous two shots. So that to me was a really great way of illustrating to me what a recency bias was. And a big reason why we're talking about the biases tonight was that, you know, we as humans, you know, our thoughts and make such a huge impact on our, on our actions and we're investing, you know, Warren Buffett has said many times that, you know, his ability to basically turn off his emotions when he's investing is what he feels like has made him a successful investor that he, you know, doesn't fall. He's aware of these biases. You know, Charlie Munger is aware of them. You know, a lot of the great investors are aware of these ideas. And if you're aware of them, then it can help you control them. Can you eliminate them completely? I don't think so because we're all humans and we all have emotions. But if you have the idea of what some of these things are going on and it enters your head about it, you can think about something like a recent seat bias or some of the other ones that we're going to talk about tonight. And that can help you manage those thoughts when you're trying to decide whether you want to buy this or buy that or sell or whatever it is you want to do, you know, you can try to make a more rational decision based on the numbers and the facts as opposed to your emotions. Because when you buy an emotion, that's a lot of times when you're going to make a big mistake. Let me uh, beat the dead horse a little bit too. Um, another, <laughs> <laughs> if, if you guys don't mind, another example of recency bias. And I personally confess to falling for this, and this was very recently. So something you can do is kind of look at the way the market has been cycling. And then because that's what happened in the past, you you extrapolate it into the future. So if you think about the last stock market crash we had, that was 2008, 2009. The bull market that ran, you know, the previous crash before that was 2000, 2001. So we had about seven to eight years, depending on where you want to start and stop, of a bull market. And I know a lot of people as well as myself figured because and because we're influenced by our biases and we tended to think, well, what happened in just recently could probably happen now. So I kind of thought that the end of the bull market would be about six to seven years after 2008, 2009. So even though I didn't... So the good thing was I had a system in place. I had my dollar cost averaging. I had the, the $150 a month in in the personal portfolio that I always talk about, I had that in place. So it didn't matter what my brain was trying to trick me into thinking. 
I was still going to dollar cost average and it wasn't going going to affect me. But I still had this real big cautiousness. And I think you still see this in the market today. Uh, there was an article I read that talks about how millennials, we are, we are so underinvested as millennials that the percentage of millennial investors is a lower percentage than even pre-depression days. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing like if you compare age groups and, and those type of things. So we have a lot of millennials that aren't even participating in the market because they were burned by, you know, either maybe they weren't personally burned, but they saw like just a lot of carnage in the stock market. You also have a lot of, you know, obviously we've had a bull market. Uh, we're recording this August, 2017, and it's still pretty strong. I mean, the last couple of days have been rough, but for the most part, we've had pretty much smooth sailing. And yet, even though we've been going on for six, seven years, we didn't see that crash that that the 2008 2009 saw around the same kind of time period i don't want to say like the exact same price to earnings valuations but definitely higher than average price to earnings valuations across the entire market but you know this bull market's kind of different what that article was saying is that you know you don't have the irrational exuberance that you saw for example during the dot com bubble where People were just jumping in and, and, you know, just throwing money and forgetting about any sort of rational, conservative, basic, logical kind of reasoning when it came to putting money into the stock market. So I guess in a sense that kind of helps investors because because we were burned so bad in 2008 and 2009, a lot of investors are more conservative when it comes to you know, not getting too crazy about the market and not just blindly jumping in. But at the same time, if you've been listening to us for any time at all, you do know that we are seeing pockets of the market where there are big time bubbles and valuations are getting really high. All that to say, be cautious of recency bias. There's a lot of different ways it can affect you. And don't think that because something happened in the past, especially recently, don't let that affect how you think the future will be because you can't you really can't predict the future at all and to think that what happened just recently will happen again that's just setting yourself up for failure absolutely absolutely you're right on that all right so the next one we're going to talk about is hindsight bias and this one's pr- pretty self-explanatory you know they say that hindsight is 2020 that you can look back at the past and you can predict what would have happened in the past. Well, duh. I mean, (laughs) everybody can see that. And, you know, with investing, you can fall into this trap as well. You know, there are a lot of people out there that, you know, will look at things that happened in the past and then they can use the data and they'll go back and predict that they would have been able to buy Google when it first went public or Amazon when it first went public. Well, you know, of course they can say that because hindsight is 2020. They, they would have been able to see that. Well, how would you, how could you possibly even know that? And think about the, you know, the crash that just recently happened, you know, not a lot of people were able to predict that. And it really kind of came out of nowhere, you know, not to the people that were aware of what was really going on, but you know, it was a it was a pretty devastating blow to people's 401ks, their pension plans, and everything. But if everybody had known it was going to happen, then they obviously would have been able to, you know, get out or protect themselves better than would have than what would have happened to them. So, you know, this one to me is kind of a, a pretty self-explanatory bias, and it's you know you, you got to protect. I, you, I guess the the best thing that I would think of with the hindsight bias is. You just need to be aware that when you look back at the history of things that have happened, you know, you have to learn from those mistakes and you have to see what really happened and try to project that forward so that you can see, you know, the types of things that could possibly happen. And, you know, a great way to do that is, you know, Andrew's book that we've talked about from time to time, The Value Trap Indicator, you know, he's looked back at all the bankruptcies that have happened over the last period of time. And, you know, by using, you know, statistics, he's able to not predict every single one, but pretty darn close, 
And you know, using that information, he can project forward when he's looking at a company that he's going to invest in. By using what's happened in the past, he can use that to help him avoid you know, something that could happen to him in the future. And I think, to me, that's where having an awareness of a hindsight bias can help you in the long run. Are you, are you reading my mind? Because I was about to bring up my <laughs> Maybe. I think we've been doing this too long together. <laughs> <laughs> so real quick, like hindsight, hindsight bias, it's really easy to think that, that you could be the one to, to sell right before a crash and buy right before a bottom. Everybody kind of has this sense that like, oh, you know, I would have been able to do it. But what I did in the book to kind of illustrate this example was I took – five random stock charts and I kind of basically I just put those on the page and I said okay here's what the stock price looked like for the past two three months here here's another one here's another one here's another would you buy here would you sell here would you sell here would you sell here and so I took you know grab the the type of charts you tend to see when it makes you feel really bullish like you know if you see that nice chart where it goes from bottom left to upper right and it's just kind of like a straight line up People really like to see that, and usually they, you know, they make it like a bullish case because oh, look how strong it's been lately, and you know that goes into the recency bias. And then some people think that oh, well, it's obvious that right at the top I should have sold here because it was going to be a crash afterwards. And then some other people say no, well, you should have you should have rode it up indefinitely, right? So. I took all those different charts and it, it turned out, you know, I, I, I explained that after the fact that, look, what, what the chart did beforehand had absolutely no relevance on, on what actually happened. And to think that just from looking at a chart that you can figure out when to get in it or out of a stock, it's, it's completely foolish and it's just, it's just completely random and, and it's not something that, you can really, you know, your mind can think that you have this ability to, to be able to, to kind of time the market in a way. And, you know, you might think in the future, like, oh, well, you know, I might have made a mistake that time, but I'll get it right this time. No, that's just hindsight bias really clouding your judgment. And so I think that's a real big reason why you need to have, like I said, for the first bias, you want to have a system in place where your dollar cost averaging. To combat this hindsight bias, I really think you need to have a strategy where you have a specific sell strategy. And we've talked about this before. Episode three, we talked about having a stop loss and, and we talk about how, you know, you can have parts of your portfolio with a stop loss and parts of your portfolio that are kind of hold forever stocks. And I kind of went into that in detail in episode three. But you, regardless of what you choose to personally do, you need to have a specific sell situation that you know in your head that you're not going to let your biases affect your emotions, your, your brain and, and your perception and, and you know, all these kinds of things that, that the mind can do. Make sure you have a system in place to counter that. That way you're not compromising your performance because you're tricking yourself into thinking that you can be the exception to the rule and be able to time the market. Hey, you. What's the best way to get started in the market? Download Andrew's free ebook at stockmarketpdf.com. You won't regret it. Absolutely. That is a, a great point. And, you know, I think that, you know, timing the market, we've talked about that before. It's kind of a fool's, fool's game. And it's not really a practice you really want to get into. The next one we're going to talk about is the confirmation bias. And,. I don't know about you, but I have definitely fallen into this one before. Uh, this is a bias that we do. We kind of seek out information that we believe is true, and we use this as kind of evidence or facts to confirm our opinion. And I'll give you an example for something that's happened to me with this many times. I find a stock that I quote unquote fall in love with and for whatever reason I read something about it that makes me intrigued by it and I think well this would be a great company to get into because I'm excited about the product that they sell or the management or something that just kind of really gets me juiced about the company and then what I'll do is as I start to analyze it I'll start to discover things that are confirming what I already think about the company 
And, you know, when I first started getting into investing, I, I fell into this a couple of times and I bought some stocks that I shouldn't have bought. And in hindsight, you know, again, 2020, you know, I looked at, you know, what I did and my decisions and they were, they were based on, I was, I was confirming what I always already thought. I wanted to, to like the company and I wanted to buy it. And so I was looking for information that was going to confirm what I was already looking for. And this is, can be a very, very dangerous game to, to play. And, you know, Charlie Munger has written several times in several articles that he's written that he talks a lot about destroying an idea. And he doesn't feel like he's successful unless he destroys any of his ideas. And what he means by that is he's going back and he's looking at, so if he, if he looks at stock A that he really wants to buy, he tries to figure out a way to tear it down. And he figures that if he could tear it down, he's tearing apart this confirmation bias because now he's actually looking at the company for what it is as opposed to having a preconceived idea about buying, you know, Coca-Cola, not maybe not Coca-Cola is the best idea, but you know, it, it, you get where I'm coming from. It's, it's the, you know, he's helping destroy an idea. And if he feels like he's destroying that idea and it still comes out as a good idea, then it's a great investment. But you know, if he's able to, you know, not destroy it, then it's not a good idea because you know, it's, he's just reinforcing what he's, what he wanted to do previously. And to me, I think this is such a dangerous bias to fall into and it's so easy to do it. And it's, it's so easy to do with just about anything. You know, if you think the weather is going to be bad and you go on the weather channel and you see that the weather is going to be bad, you're just kind of confirming what you think the weather is going to be bad, but then you go out and it's an absolutely fantastic day. So, you know, it's just, you know, it's, it can be such a dangerous bias and it's something that we have to be aware of when we're investing. Yeah. It's almost like you put blinders on, right? And yeah, exactly. You look at information and you just see, you, you see what ignore, you want to see. Right. Exactly. It's like this rose colored kind of filter in there. Yeah. I, mean, I think the big way to counteract this is to have a similar approach for every stock you're looking at. So Whereas, you know, with a confirmation bias, you can kind of cherry pick and, you know, well, okay, well, you know, I like this ratio this month and I like this ratio the next month. Yeah, I think it's okay to have some sort of variation, but at the end of the day, you want to have an approach that's very consistent. And if you're analyzing stocks in a very similar way in January, February, March, April, May, June, I think that's the best way to kind of combat this confirmation bias because, you're still staying consistent. And so when you have enough numbers, and obviously I love to be numbers based, you have enough of these numbers that are giving you the buy signals, then you're not going to have, you know, your chances of looking at the data and coming up with a different conclusion and having that conclusion be wrong. Those chances are really diminished when you're consistent and you stay with an approach that's numerical and is based on fundamentals and principles that have been proven and that you'll continue to use over time. Exactly. That's, that's a very, very good point is being consistent in your, you know, analysis and your, you know, picking of the stocks and, and weighing out how you want to have a process and, you know, having a checklist and having, you know, a, you know, a, a numerical system like Andrew has is just, it's a fantastic way to help avoid this bias. I totally, totally agree. The next one we're going to talk about is survivorship bias. I'm going to have Andrew take a stab at that one first. Yeah, I did write an email about this one recently. So this is kind of more of an advanced thing. When you start to become an investor who likes to look back at the past and try to take lessons from what happened in the past, so keep in mind with all these biases, you know, we talk about how looking in the past can really hurt you. It can't, you know, it, so be aware of where it can hurt you, but it can also be very beneficial. Obviously, that's how we get all of our lessons today and how we can build on the shoulders of giants by learning from what's happened in the past. So what can happen and what a lot of investors do when they want to try to figure out, you know, where can I get an an investing edge or, or how did a certain ratio perform or equation, uh, they'll, they'll use a back test. And so 
what a back test does, if anybody who's listening is not aware, basically you take a group of stocks and you usually use some metrics, kind of like a screener where you're putting this criteria. If a stock fell in that criteria, let's say 10 years ago, now you track all the stocks that were in that particular criteria and you look 10 years later, see how they performed. The problem with doing a back test like that is depending on where you get your data, uh, a lot of the companies that, you know, this might change in the future, by the way, but as far as today, 2017, a lot of these companies that provide this data do not keep the data of stocks that have already gone bankrupt. And, you know, there, I think there is a service I wrote in my email, but it's, it's extremely expensive and it's not practical for the average investor. So like if, if you are basically trying to do a back test with only stocks that have survived, obviously you're not getting the whole picture. You're not seeing the stocks that might have gone bankrupt or gone private and lost shareholders a lot of money. So it might tilt these back tests up and make the results look better than they were because basically the the way to describe it is it's it's called survivorship bias. And you want to keep that in mind anytime you see especially, you know, if if you're looking at media where it's kind of like I don't know, like a mainstream media where the person you're listening to might not be credible, you know, or might not be that experienced where they don't understand back tests and the effect of survivorship bias on back tests. So keep that, you know, any studies or data articles that are based on back tests, make sure you look and see if they've accounted for survivorship bias, because if they haven't, the data is likely basically useless. It's going to be incorrect data because it's not accounting for the companies that didn't survive. And that has such a big impact on a decision you make because, like you were saying, it skews skews the numbers. You know, if there's not, you know, something in there that could be so obviously negative and have an impact on, you know, the return of that particular sector or that particular company or even that particular, you know, market, you know, that has a big impact on it, especially if there's a period of time where there were a lot of companies going bankrupt at that time that can have such a big impact. You know, I know you wrote about that in your book and it seems like, you know, if I remember correctly, there were a lot of those companies that went bankrupt were all kind of in a condensed period of time. And if you look at a back test during that period of time and those companies are not involved in that, then that could really skew that time period and make you make a, an, a judgment based on faulty information, I guess is the best way of putting it. All right, folks. Well, that is going to wrap it up for us for tonight. I hope you enjoyed our discussion on biases and how they can affect our investing decisions. You know, the way we think there are some aspects of it that we actually can control and having an awareness of what some of these things are happening while they're happening can help us control some of those thoughts and help us make better decisions. And that's what we're here to do is to talk to you about trying to make better decisions. And that was what our discussion tonight was all about, was trying to make better decisions and being aware of how our thoughts can affect us. And if you want to learn more about this, I'm going to sh- – uh, Andrew wrote a great article about some of these biases. I'm going to link to that article. Also, there is a great book that I would highly, highly recommend. It's called Poor Charlie's Almanac, and it was – a compilation of Charlie Munger's greatest thoughts. So he's given some great speeches through the years. He also has some great articles and they have also, you know, all kinds of great Mungerisms and it's just a wealth of knowledge and there's just so many great things. And he's very much a expert in this field of, you know, the, the mental aspect of investing. So I'd highly recommend you take check that out. So without any further ado, why don't you guys go out there and find some good intrinsic value Invest with a margin of safety, emphasis on safety, and have a great week, and we'll see you guys next week. We hope you enjoyed this content. Seven Steps to Understanding the Stock Market shows you precisely how to break down the numbers in an engaging and readable way with real-life examples. Get access today at stockmarketpdf.com. Until next time, have a prosperous day. 
The information contained is for general information and educational purposes only. It is not intended for a substitute for legal, commercial, and or financial advice from a licensed professional. Review our full disclaimer at einvestingforbeginners.com.